Well, this is a treat to be here, Carol. Thank you for organizing this. Um, I really enjoyed Bob's presentation and the opportunity to talk all about this. I feel like I want to do more listening this evening than talking since I have, uh, I should say, also one of my board members, Lynn Segale, and, and Bob, whose, whose research has been enormously influential to me, and, and James, who did an extraordinary job curating and pulling together our centennial exhibit. Um, so I'll, well, I'll just start with one observation. I, I was thinking, because Bob, when you're in your talk, you talk about the criticisms of regional plan association and, and the work that we've done. And I think I've always tried to be very cognizant of, aware of, and even, and even respectful of the different types of critiques that emerge about RPA and, and thinking about. And some of it is there, there are the great personalities, the Jane Jacobs and the Robert Moses and, 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 and the, the Mumfords and things, because approaching the centennial of RPA and the work that's been done, of course, I'm very proud of, of the work of the organization over 100 years. I'm very proud of the work that we do today. I'm also, I think, I think the kind of history of studying urban planning um, and the history of it, you also become acutely aware of the enormous mistakes that were made by the profession. You know, somebody thought this was a good idea to, to plow a highway through the middle of, a, of an urban community or bulldoze entire neighborhoods and other kinds of things. And, and I, I always find myself trying to think like, you know, today say congestion pricing is a, is a big priority for us at RPA or building a tunnel under the Hudson River. I think those are great ideas. I think they need to advance and I'm trying to do everything I can to do them. But I also try to approach all this with, you know, to not fall into the trap of hubris and to take very seriously the criticisms of the kind of work that we've done in the past and are doing, are doing today, just to try and keep them in mind. Um, so that as we pursue the different projects and priorities and goals that we're, that we're thinking about, we are being mindful of, respectful of, trying as much as possible to listen to the opposition, understand where it's coming from, um, and use that to improve the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, in my own mind, there are certain kinds of debates. I still, when I, when I teach up at Columbia, I still give my students the um, Mumford criticism of the first regional plan, and then Thomas Adams's response, which maybe is less eloquent, but I think actually holds up pretty well. Um, and, and it's a debate about a lot of things, partially kind of a pragmatic approach versus a more idealistic approach, a debate about growth and whether it's beneficial and or, or whether we should be trying to attract and promote growth, simply accommodate it or actually stop it. And then, of course, I point out to my students, you know, entire the conversations about gentrification and other things today are in some ways an updated modern debate about those similar kinds of issues. And so I think in urban planning, these issues keep coming around and around. Um, and, and I just do try to, to kind of approach our centennial and everything that I think James, we, we tried to give James a very free hand in writing his own, his own piece about this and hearing kind of Bob, your, your, your history about the work that we've done. For me, that's very, very valuable because it helps us better understand this history. And it does literally inform the kind of work that we're doing today. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and listen to the rest of you all talk about that. I don't know, if, if I had to ask a question of this group, I would say, which of the criticisms that have been leveled at RPA um, stick the most? Or maybe, you know, are there, are there areas today that we ought to be really careful about that we're working on? Because, because we get quite zealous in, our, in, in the work that we're trying to do. Well, let's not let the silence get too long. Um, <laughs> um, Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let me respond to something that, that Tom said, which is, and what Carol uh, framed as the focus of this panel, which is, does planning matter? What is planning for? And I think that the, 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 the make two comments. One, the RPA is a provocative civic voice, and that's its role. And um, in that role, it's not that RPA or another organization is going to put forth a firm uh, vision of what should be a firm agenda, but their role is to 
lay out a vision, which is not necessarily just graphic, but, but really a, a humanistic or, or, or urban vision of what can be. And then in a democracy, picking up Bob's point about what the lesson was, in a democracy, the role of a plan, and I've, I've said this before, and I, listening to the talk, I feel even more firmly about this, the role of the plan is to, to generate discussion of what should be. Mm -hmm. It's not as a, from a top-down kind of perspective to say, this will be. It, it, it is to generate discussion, and particularly in the post World War II era, the way civic organization and civic participation has evolved, that discussion is crucial because the first plan doesn't work most times. It's the <laughs> second or the third permutation of what the initial idea was and how it gets transformed. So I, I, I do think that, that planning plays a particular role in urban areas, which because it's, a, in my perspective, a platform for discussion and a put forth a vision is not as well understood as the graphic plan, Yeah, you know, so. Well, <clears throat> you know, if I can <clears throat> follow up on, on that response to Tom, I think that uh, you know, the, most you know, the most dangerous moments for the RPA are when everybody agrees with you. Yeah, <laughs> and that's right. To me, you know, the, what was so illuminating about this episode is that uh, there was so much power behind the idea that rail transit was obsolete, mm -hmm. that uh, it was you know, a waste of, of money to put even a cent into it. Uh, and, you know, and the basic questions of just could a region like New York run on highways and buses alone private transportation, you know, in other words, Moses wasn't even asking that question. Uh, and, and even, and it wasn't just Moses, it was Austin Tobin and the Port Authority who were, who felt the exact same way. And here's where I think your kind of unique status as an independent organization that has endured over decades, uh, you know, enable you to, you know, to, to buck uh, a consensus. Mm -hmm. when it has to be bucked. And I know how hard that, that is, but uh, that seems to me to be at the heart of what, you know, what the RPA is, you know, has become or should become. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I would say that I was very um, appreciative uh, of your focusing on this era. Um, because in doing the exhibition, which had to look, I mean, it was really structured around the four regional plans, just to remind everyone. Um, yeah. The occasion of the exhibition was the commencement of work on the first regional plan in 1922. The plan was not, in fact, published. Part one of the plan was published in 1929, in the spring of 29, so notably just a few months before the stock market crash and the start of the Great Depression. And then there was the second part published in 1931. And uh, it proved enormously influential. We can go into the reasons for it. But the, there was a second plan, so-called, uh, that emerged in the late mid to late 1960s. We'll get back to that. The third plan published in 1996, uh, 97. And then the fourth recent plan published uh, in about, what now, five 2017. years? 2017, about five years ago. So every one of the plans is like a child to me because they all have their different flavor. Um, the firstborn is the, naturally the extroverted one that gets all the attention. Uh, the first one was so influential and so gorgeous. Um, and it's one of the things that really got me excited about it the first time when I was still a college student was just seeing the actual plan, the books themselves, not the Avery Library at Columbia, and just kind of going through this New York that could have been and the kind of dripping gorgeousness of these amazing renderings, you showed one or two of those marvelous aerial images, but then all these kind of fantastic images, uh, which were so influential, not only in planning, but as we try to point out, in popular culture, I mean, the very vision of what the future city was for easily 15, 20 years, which is to say from 1930 to 1950, roughly, was really basically based on the regional plan, which then was interpreted by magazine articles, 
Hollywood films, the Futurama, General Motors Futurama. You know, you can we put those pictures side by side. It was very obvious, and the RPA plan came first. So, um, the second plan was the is the sort of neglected second child, I think. Um, the in part for for a couple of reasons. In part because it wasn't unlike the other three. It wasn't one plan. It was a series of volumes. You showed the, the spines of the books. It was eight volumes. My feeling was that, under, my understanding of it was that the sort of wind went out of the RPA sales somewhere in the late, sometime around World War II. And having been enormously influential through Robert Moses and the Port Authority in the 20s, and the, well, in the 30s and into the 40s, after the war, it was not clear what, why you would need a regional plan. Hadn't the first regional plan sort of <clears throat> laid everything out? There was in fact talk once the Verrazano Narrows Bridge thing called the Narrows Crossing was, was approved in the late 50s, which was the last big proposal of the original 1930 regional plan. Some people said, well, maybe we should just go out of business. I mean, we've done everything. Built. Robert Moses and Austin Tobin have basically built most of what we wanted to get built and the other things like the rail line connections were obviously not going to happen. So they were, in my view, regrouping in the late 60s. They were still, they were, they were not what they had been or what they would be again. And I don't think, I, I may be wrong about this, I don't think they actually had the resources yeah. to create a full, full on regional plan. Fair enough, because the, you know, something like a regional plan takes six years to do costs millions of dollars to do. You have to, you know, it's an incredible piece of work. So kind of intelligently from that point of view, if you couldn't do that, well, not don't do nothing. So what they did, what they could do, which was issue a series of smaller volumes on specific topics and a uh, very interesting array of topics. Some of them very, one was called the Lower Hudson. And it was really a, a, in its way, completely revolutionary thinking about this key turning moment in New York history, which was that the port, which had supported New York for even by then 150 years, was obviously containerization was going to mean that the port was going to leave Manhattan and Brooklyn and the edge of Brooklyn, the fringe that had supported it. They were the first to say, okay, that's going to happen whether we like it or not. New York City itself was in complete denial about it. Um, and they said, well, it's going to happen. So the question is, isn't whether it's going to happen or not, but what could we do based on it? What could we, how could we reuse the waterfront? And they were the first to set out a vision of what is basically the new modern waterfront that we live with today, 21st century. So it was enormously influential in different ways. My sense is that they were, it was the time that they were the loneliest voice. I would argue that in 1996, New York had gone through a lot. It was back on the upswing. Um, you could put proposals, and they might have seemed far-fetched, but they were kind of with, Tom, um, I would suggest, the tide of history was moving mm -hmm. forward. But the, <clears throat> set, the late 60s plan was the time when the RPA was at most out of sync with the tide of history, because the tide of history had been Robert Moses and, and Austin and the Port Authority, and just everything you said, that you know there was no future in transit, and the highways were the way to go. It was just a few voices here and there may be beginning to change. Jane Jacobs here and a few other people. But um, to say that no, the future could be transit was a kind of absurd, ridiculous thing to say. And they had, and they had no, no um, what would you say? No, no um, status, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Who was gonna listen to them? <clears throat> like, what was the agency going to be that was going to, the New York City Transit Authority, <laughs> which was just barely trying to get a 10, you know, it would be like, token raise of 10 to 15 cents. So they would lose only a hundred million dollars a year. The port, the Trans Hudson tube lines, which were, had barely survived only because of the World Trade yeah. Center. Like what was the, the New York Central running, you know, the, 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 the transit line, you know, the, the, the regional rail, a Long Island Railroad, all bankrupt or almost all bankrupt. So where were they, you know, who was going to actually listen to them? Um, so I think it was kind of remarkably brave and amazing that they did say it. And it goes to, and this is really to Lynn's point, what do planners do? Um, there's, there's uh, in, in the review of our show, 
uh, Justin Sav Davidson referred in New York Magazine referred to uh, a wonderful phrase by Richard Powers in The Overstory, and he, he referred to the speed of trees. And you know, that's what planning <laughs> is, it's the speed of trees. And, you know, Gregory Gilmartin wrote a wonderful history of the Municipal Arts Society, some sister of the RPA in its way, called Shaping the City. And what I remember most from that book was like, they would recommend things and 40 years later, they, you know, they would say there ought to be a city planning commission. And they kept saying it and saying it. And Gil Martin's point was, things don't happen in a legislature until the stupidest alderman <laughs> thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And how long does that take? Not the progressive one, not the Fiorella LaGuardia types or whatever jumping on the new thing, but like the dumbest guy um, has to think it's a good idea and vote for it. And then finally it becomes, and it can take decade after decade after decade. And the MAS, kept going, saying we need a landmark submission of city planning commission, zoning and those things. And the RPA has kept going. But the moment, I, I mean, this is all to say that I totally agree with your thesis, that, <laughs> that it wasn't that the RPA said it and then it happened. It was that they were the voice that gave a positive idea. And I'll, this is, I'll shut up in a minute, but but you know, New York, as you pointed out, could never survive on a high. New York could not be Los Angeles. It just didn't work that way. But that's a negative. That's saying it couldn't be the model of the 20, 20th, sort of mid 20th century city. So, okay, so it couldn't be that. What could it be? And that's what the RPA said. It could be something else. And to put a kind of positive angle on it. And it was a really kind of an extraordinary thing. And as it turned out, it took you know a few years, but David Rockefeller was listening, and excuse me, Nelson Rockefeller was listening. David might have been listening too, uh, but Nelson was certainly listening, and it gave them the ammunition to well, it seems two things: one, to organize the MTA and come up with the daring idea that you were going to cross subsidize the MTA from the Triborough Bridge, you were going to make the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority part of the MTA, and you were going to basically take money from Robert Moses and give it to transit, which he said over my dead body and Rockefeller said, okay, <laughs> yeah. um, in April, yeah. Yeah. April, yeah. <laughs> April, 1968. And the other thing less understood is really pushing for federal funding for the UMTA yeah, that's stuff. That's, yeah. That was the sort of less glamorous, doesn't make a great Robert Caro story, but I think that was at the critical time. So that's and my two cents. It's an undercurrent that's, uh, uh, that's explicit in the name of the organization, the Regional Plan Association. But I don't think, I, one of the reasons it's successful is the fact that it's regional, okay? Whereas there are very few regional planning organizations, whether they be governmental or they be voluntary uh, 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 nonprofits that do think on a regional basis. And I think that's implicit, Bob, in your comments about the survival and about density as as a role. It, it's regional. It's not just New York City. Think yeah, about right. New York City. It's regional Connecticut, New York City, New Jersey, because the center of the metropolis doesn't work without yeah. the region. And that's been a, a very hard argument for planners to make historically, even though logically that is correct. Yeah. It's been very hard, and I've been at many a conference where regionalism has been discussed without the passion that mm -hmm. generally exists in New York about regionalism. Yeah, and, and if I could, you know, just build on that a, a bit, that uh, that beside, you know, that that what was happening also was, you know, there were literally millions of subway riders, of commuters, who were <clears> screaming. <throat> about what was happening to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and because the problem was regional, it was very difficult. You, know, you had to really invent institutions on the fly in effect. And you know that was, you know, that to me, you know, it, it's not glamorous, it's impossible to represent in, you know, in an exhibition. But that, you know, that hard work of institution building, which, you know, in other words, someone, you know, obviously we identify it with Nelson Rockefeller and so on, but 
the the issue was, as I say, there was this in, incredible frustration, anger, and so on that was just not being able to be reflected in existing uh, institutions, which all said, well, that's not my responsibility. We don't have the funding for it, et cetera, et cetera. And I could well imagine uh, you know, that you know, rail transit would have been lost because of that. You know, one of the things, you know, I, I lived for 22 years just outside Detroit. And, you know, I visited, you know, there's this other great terminal, you know, other great terminal by Warren and Whitmore, uh, you know, Michigan Station in Detroit, which until recently was a ruin. And, you know, I, I, I understand, I think, what can happen, you know, when, you know, when things fail. The, uh, Go ahead. It's hard to imagine, you know, my father said that, you know, I think even more than 1920, he said that when the railroads started complaining in the late 50s and early 60s that they were running out of money, he said nobody believed it. He said Pennsylvania Railroad had been the richest corporation in the world. And he's yeah. like, how could the railroads be <laughs> running out of money? They had been right. just the definition of a wealthy corporation. But one of the ways to understand the sad story of Penn Station is these guys were desperate. And when someone came and yeah. said, we'll pay you to uh, to build something on top of your station, you keep the concourse running, but all that empty air over it, uh, Madison Square Garden and Two Penn Plaza, uh, the Felts were, they were like, hallelujah, yeah. absolutely. We sell air. And when it's like <laughs> short of the $24 deal, it's like the best thing that ever happened to them because people now go, how could they do it? Well, if you're a if you're a company running in the red for year after year, you know, and they somebody comes along and will give you tens of millions of dollars for something, sure, absolutely, yeah. you know, it was absolutely. Yeah. There's and Grand Central too. And Grand Central was going to do the New York Central was going to do right, the same right. thing. Penn there's Central, there's a great thing. oral history. So so Charles McKim Norton, whose father Charles Dyer Norton was the impetus who originally convened the committee on the regional plan in 1922, sadly didn't make it to 29 to, to see the release of it. But his son, Kim Norton, who um, I never met, sadly, and I, and I feel like we went to the same high school, we live in the same community. I feel like somehow I'm kind of following in his footsteps. There's a wonderful oral history up at Avery Library of Columbia that I've, I've read and reread many times for the insights in it. But he talks to the point that James was just making where he, he got a question about, you know, the first plan comes out with here's here's how the highway network should be built and here's how the, the mass transit network should be built. And, you know, one of them gets built very, very quickly and the other one we're still waiting. And he says exactly what you said. He said, come on, you know, in the 1920s, who were the richest people on the face of the earth? It was the robber barons of the great railroad wealth. And I remember reading that and thinking, yeah, that would be like me putting out a report that would say, you know, these tech guys are morons. They don't know what they're going to do. It'll all be a puff of smoke. And maybe Twitter will be. But but most of them, you know, it, well, it's interesting, but it's a kind of an assumption that, and, and there is a kind of, you know, as an organization trying to figure out where we devote our resources and time, where should we push? I, I also, I just got a Lynn, Lynn talking about the unique regional aspect of what we do and, and the importance of it. And because I studied Bob Fishman in graduate school, I know <laughs> I actually try to differentiate, and I'm not going to push for a change of the name of RPA, but that the you wrote about the regionalists versus the metropolitanists, and the, the regionalists were really the RPAA. I flunk any student of mine who doesn't know the difference between them, <laughs> which was, of course, the Regional Planning Association of America, the loose-knit group of the Benton Mackay and Lewis Mumford and the intellectuals who never formed an organization, created a regional plan, Kind of tried to institutionalize the work that they were doing, but also conceptually had this idea of a region should be a kind of balanced. There shouldn't be any any concentration at the core of it, but rather rather um, you know a, a completely kind of balanced um, uh, geographic, economic, cultural uh, form. Whereas the metropolitanist point of view, you argue, which I, I, and that RBA has argued is that the center of the region has the great density, the highest concentration, and that there's a relationship between the parts of the region that we have to understand. Um, 
and kind of so working in that with that perspective and then thinking about what are the institutions that we have to try and affect change and there are very very few you know, you've got the port authority in 1921 you've got the mta in 1968 i would argue in the land use probably most people have never heard the of the tri-state regional planning commission because it didn't go very far and didn't make it and was and, you know essentially disbanded and turned into a bunch of little mbos that haven't done too much now on land use i would argue that the the regional commissions the Highlands Council and the Pine Barrens Commission in New Jersey, the Pine Barrens Commission on Eastern Long Island on, a, on an environmental work, we've actually figured out a, a workaround around that. But those are, you know, they're very few and far between in terms of examples of effective regional institutions. And one of the concerns I have, and we struggled with this in the fourth regional plan, is to what degree are we trying to Kind of tell them what they, we think they should be doing that they aren't. Hey, MTA, go do congestion pricing or something like that. Versus actually thinking about are the models still the right ones? Because we haven't really amended the public authority model, you know, in 100 or 50 years. We did a lot of research looking at MTR in Hong Kong, Transport for London. The Greater London Authority is only, what, 23 years old now. So the rest of the world is kind of inventing or reinventing institutions with very different corporate structures, funding mechanisms, governance models, and others. And we kind of assume that 100 years from now, we'll have a Port Authority and an MTA that, you know, while they might have expanded their purview or budget or geography or other things, won't be that fundamentally different from what they are today. It's a hard one for me, going back to an earlier comment I made, you know, we're a small organization, it's a big region, pick your battles wisely. Mm -hmm. And um, I did, I'll just to close, I'll say, I, 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 we did a program this morning at the Federal Reserve Bank, kind of celebrating the 75, now 76 year anniversary of the release of another report RPA did that was very important called the Airports of Tomorrow, where mm -hmm. in the 1940s, we teamed up with the Port Authority, there was the big debate, and battle between Robert Moses and Austin Tobin and, and the idea would New York City control its airports the way Chicago does today, or would the Port Authority be able to put in a regional um, uh, structure with Newark? And we, we, we convened a conference in the 40s and, and issued a report that strongly argued in favor of the Port Authority perspective. Anyway, I'll just say it was interesting because I, I kind of did had a conversation with the chairman and executive director of the Port Authority who are now entering their sixth year working together. And the Port Authority has been just literally by, <laughs> frankly, these two men being able to work together, being able to kind of hold off too much of the political interference. Um, the Port Authority these days is actually making very concrete steps towards improving the airports, towards modernizing systems, towards trying to do what they can. And so um, so anyway, I kind of, sorry, I'm rambling here, but just thinking about this kind of, we have so few institutions that we can work with to do the kinds of work that we're trying to do. Um, so we find ourselves trying to figure out, you know, to what degree do we just work with what we have or create new ones? And I'll say the last one that I think is really important is a debate that's now coming forward on, on a, that's a regional debate, I think too, but it's not infrastructure so much, is on the land use side and, and the acute housing affordability crisis that we're seeing, I think brings forward a hundred year old debate in planning, which is how much of the decision-making should be given to the local municipality yeah. and hyper-local and home rule and all that versus understanding that there is a county, region, statewide, interest in how these decisions are made too. And Governor Hochul, I give Governor Kathy Hochul enormous credit for rolling out over the last few weeks, a series of proposals all wrapped around trying to deal with New York State's housing crisis that is just, to my point of view, just trying to take back a very small bit of the local land use control by which communities, the suburbs in around New York City, especially the New York suburbs, not not so much Connecticut, New Jersey, are, are allowing virtually no new housing anywhere near train stations, even though the state and the feds have now put 
12 billion plus dollars into improving the Long Island Railroad, you can't build any housing anywhere near a train station in Nassau County. Well, I mean, it's, it's, Sorry, it's, it's particularly ironic given the fact that New York State through now called the Empire State Development Corporation has the power to override local zoning, right. which is the result of Rockefellers pushing through the UDC Act on the, you know, the deathbed of Martin Luther King. Absolutely. And he couldn't do it either. Yeah. And they have it on paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's the right thing, not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's the right thing to override. What I would say is the idea of what you can achieve by either full or limited override, override is right. It is incredibly hard politically to pull off. Yes. And the question is what, is there any kind of mitigation that would, lessen the barriers you would think next to transit station it would do but there is this myth about apartment buildings being a negative on property values i mean there are myths around these barriers to greater greater housing density in suburban areas when suburbs suburbs these days are not just full of single family houses right, right. You know, but there is a there is a, there's a, a a myth barrier that needs to be shattered. Yeah, another component is the transit oriented development. Another key piece of this that's been in the Times written up lately is accessory dwelling units. And you would think it's the end of Western civilization if somebody rented out the apartment above their garage. But if they could have their children in that apartment, right. that might be yeah. different. Right, right, it might be different exactly. And and it's you know and and interestingly it's starting to to tee up in a kind of political dialogue with you know liberals here and conservatives over there. And by the way, what we're talking about is um, giving property owners the option of doing more things with their private property. Just which what you, Airbnb does. Yeah. Just yeah. what Airbnb does. Yeah. It's it's just a different. Level it's just a thing. different different kind of, and yet it and yet and yet somehow it's playing out in a different way. But, but I, I guess I'll just to, to, to try to say, it's like from our perspective, figuring out w which levers to push on and how to do it. The other thing I, I, I will just say is Bob kind of saying that the most dangerous times are when everyone's in agreement. And suddenly, you know, I'm going to have many sleepless nights <laughs> um, because there's, there's an enormous amount of, of consensus around a lot of these issues. Um, I don't know how much of it will get done, but you know, we are in the throes of pushing through congestion pricing. We have extraordinary housing proposals on the table. The president was in town this afternoon announcing $300 million for Gateway. And at least on its surface, very few people are kind of actively opposed to these things. And so now I'm starting to worry that, that, that 50 years from now, there's going to be a panel here talking about all the dumb things I was doing. Right. Well, I hope not. The, uh, the, I am as a New Jersey native, I have to uh, to to recall the Mount Laurel decisions. Yeah. Or, you know, other words, uh, there you know there is this long history of of that struggle against you know against home rule, and I I think that you know I mean there is you know in other words you don't have to worry there about having no opponents. Yeah, yeah, no, we won't. We, uh, the, the the support yeah. for home rule runs deep, even yeah. though I would argue, I, I don't know, I think to try and tell me what has been a worse public policy in terms of its actual outcomes, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't deal with our housing issue. It doesn't deal with the segregated and isolated society that we have. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't yeah. deal with traffic congestion. It doesn't give us clean air or water. And yet somehow everyone thinks home rule is such a great idea. Yeah. Hmm. What, well, I guess the, you know, to go back to your your paper or your talk, um, you know, it was so emblematic of the fact that you were trying to support a kind of commuter rail system. I think it's worth actually teasing out, you, you know, mass transit covers a lot of ground and the subway system is mass transit. But you really were talking, it seemed to me, mostly about the commuter rail system, which is the quintessential regional problem because you know, you might say that um, I've always felt that, you know, this, 
my partner Ingrid loves to say, your strengths are your weaknesses and your weaknesses are your strengths. Mm -hmm. The strength of New York City uh, post 1898 was that it was a world unto itself. They annexed 300 square miles to make this giant, giant place that was going to be completely efficient in that it was politically and legally contiguous so that there were five boroughs and the five boroughs were the same as the counties, which were made up the city of New York all under a single mayor. Doesn't seem like that big a deal until you look at a place like Los Angeles, for example, which has 88 cities in its region, uh, of which the city of Los Angeles is only one. Many unincorporated areas in the middle, as if, for example, you would take Brooklyn Heights and say, not only is it not going to be part of New York City, it's not going to be part of any city. It's right. just going to be part of the run by the some state organization. Or London, which did not have the powerful identity. We thought of it as a place, but it was actually the boroughs carried all this power and the Greater London Council, which was created relatively late, um, that had nothing like the Lord Mayor there is not the same as the mayor here. So the, the, comparatively, New York works very well. And it's not just that sort of simplicity of political and legal and administrative power. It's that New Yorkers, people who live in the city of New York, think of themselves as New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. And anybody who doesn't live there lives somewhere else. That's just a whole not true of Los Angeles in the same way or where those borders are. We know exactly where the borders are. And um, such that when you talk about, as there has been talk, extending the subway to New Jersey is for New Yorkers, it, it's just a, a, a crazy idea. Like, what, what do you mean? How, how would you extend the, well, you'd build a tunnel and you would have, you know, yeah, just yeah. like you have under the yeah. East River. No, but wait a minute, the subway can't go to New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. um, why would that be? And so, you know, this goes to the idea that of all cities, because we effectively had our own region, New York City had its own region, it had its own expansion, which in fact lasted most of the 20th century. There was still empty land to build on in the five boroughs of New York City until the very end, until the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s. We have trouble, oddly enough, we have more trouble thinking regionally than other places, which have a more diffuse structure. And it becomes very difficult to convince people in Long Island that their, you know, their it's interests matter, are the same. Yeah, yeah. I, we, we made the point in our series that weirdly enough, it was 9-11, that when you mapped the, the places who, which had lost people, you suddenly saw a map of regional, you know, metropolitan New York. And it wasn't a administrative thing, it was an emotional thing. It was yeah. like all these people from all over the place were related, it turned out. They did have something in common. And that if you destroyed this building in the middle of the city, you would actually have 15,000 people all across the metropolitan area will have lost an immediate loved one. What a strange and odd way to show it, but that's what it was. So I think the issue though of the regional rail and, and how fragile and difficult the idea of regional rail was that it covered three states, and many, many cities with no jurisdiction. There was no jurisdiction. The state of New York didn't run what happened in Connecticut or New Jersey. So somehow you were gonna to have to create this thing where there was literally no governmental oversight or structure of the whole thing. It had been reliant on private rail. And of course, that's another historical reality of the United States, which is that our rail system is built privately, not publicly. It's not like we don't have SCNF for British Rail or whatever. And so you had these private companies. And of course, no surprise that the 29 plan couldn't make those companies get together. But here we were 40 years later, trying to not unify everything. And you're still trying to get still things trying. to work. Yeah. And, you know, it's a tough, a tough uh, road to hoe. And you guys really, you don't have that power, but you do, the regional plan does have the power of example and influence and so forth. And it's the best we have for this situation. Yeah. I, I used to think my job should be to put myself out of business, that if <laughs> I could just convince, you know, but I've, I've come to realize, I mean, you say it's the best we have, but it's actually, it's, it's wonderful to have, you know, no responsibility of actually implementing it, but be able to continually raise the issues and, <laughs> and talk about them. 
actually, I'll come back to also, you know, the how concerned I should be about we're all in agreement. One yeah. thing that is, I mean, look, the thing that we're all worried about right now is what does the post-COVID city region landscape look like? And that's an area where I find myself last week, I found myself arguing with somebody who I think is probably right more of the time than I am, but but badly wrong on this, because he was very pessimistic about the future. And, and there's, a, there's an argument to be made that we still haven't really uh, seen the worst effects of COVID on, you know, the argument goes essentially that the that the work from home means that the commercial office buildings will hollow out, which and then once the federal funding runs out, then we're going to see, we're going to go into a 1970s era downward spiral of, of fiscal crisis and cutbacks in services, creating more fiscal crisis and cutbacks in services. I don't believe see things that way. I think, and in particular, I think if you're only looking at the city as your unit of analysis, you might see the world that way. But with COVID, you know, everybody who's working from home is now in a different community, maybe paying money into and revitalizing that community. And of course, if we can reinvent Midtown Manhattan, which the new New York panel came out with, I think there's a, there's a potentially very positive thing about this. And actually, you know, we'll invoke 9-11, the tragedy of 9-11, but it did actually, I think, it made people more aware. I think it made New Yorkers more demanding of better architecture and design. It made us better clients. And so I think that the generation of work that's been done since 9-11 reflected that because of the obsession with the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan. And I think COVID may have similar effects um, like that too. But that's an area where almost, you know, right to Mumford Adams right now, you can get people really fighting about what they think the future is going to be. And both of them have a lot of ammunition to back up what they, they're arguing. You know, I think the, the, the doom and gloom perspective um, is, is really short-term thinking uh, in mm -hmm. the sense that if you look at who's, not everybody can work from home and it's not just the essential workers right. who can't work from home. But it, demographically, I believe that there are differences across uh, populations, across the professional populations. If you go into a midtown restaurant at seven o'clock, uh, you will see a lot of people who are not working from home. They're there to meet friends. They're there to find partners. They're there to find a love life. And so demographically, it may be that there are households and professionals and individuals who want to work at home because they have families or because they prefer not to have as vibrant a social life. But if you think about the business community and what is required to advance in a career, it's really hard to do that sitting at home in front of your computer, yeah. 724. And uh, I think that there are adjustments in, in, the, in, the, in the work life of an urban area, just the way there have been massive adjustments after 9-11. But I think we are at the very beginning of understanding mm -hmm. those adjustments. And if you believe basically one of the points that Bob was making in his talk about density, and they and what you know, schooled on on Vernon and Hoover myself, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. when I was a planning student, the face to face communication that doesn't happen at home in front of the yeah. computer, yeah. and it is the city's true comparative advantage um, historically, and I believe it still will be under a new set of work arrangements. But yeah. even if you have people coming, yeah. eighty percent of the people coming in Tuesday through Thursday, that still makes a big difference in the life of the city. And especially if you can yeah, really I, get more residential. Yeah, I, I, I would just say, yeah, I wish we had a, a new Vernon and Hoover yeah. <laughs> to, you know, to, to address this question, you know, what is New York's comparative advantage? What is its strengths? And looking back at the real one from what was it, 1955, 59, uh, 
you know, they got some things wrong. And one of the things they got wrong that I think was, was significant was they were relatively complacent about the future of manufacturing oh, you know, really? yeah. in New yeah. York and yeah. the New York region because they thought, you know, manufacturing, you know, that there's a special kind of manufacturing that would still thrive in New York. And they didn't realize how standardized manufacturing was going to be well, in this they, country. They, their argument, if I remember correctly, yeah. is built on the specialization of labor and the specialization of all, basically agglomeration of all the little specialists that made yeah. up, for example, the garment center, Thinking why the garment center that. was so mm -hmm. significant, yeah. how buyers all came to yeah. the center part. But the other piece that I do think is important to cities comparative advantage is culture. Yeah. The density of culture that you can only get in a, with some type of centralized urban area, as opposed to a more balanced area that you mentioned, Tom. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. You know, but, it, but I, I think that we need that, that you know, kind of reimagination. You know, New, New York, you know, didn't thrive as you know. I mean, the manufacturing sector was virtually eliminated, but New York was so strong in office and culture and leisure and so on that it more than made up for it, as no one really expected. Right. Now I think we need a similar kind of re-examination of what that office culture is going to be, how it's going to work, whether it will support the, the square footage of office space we have. I mean, that's what I mean by you know, that uh, maybe it's impossible to really know this in advance, but those are the things that will determine. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll, I'll say two things. One, as a, as a little kid growing up on the Upper West Side in the 1970s, it wasn't without pain, that transformation. <laughs> and so I don't want to try and minimize yeah. uh, all, all of that. But, but we did come through. Actually, as you're talking about Vernon and stuff, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, the more uh, the better comparable would be the work of Saskia Sassen in Global Cities in the early yeah. 90s, when, of course, there was this thesis, OK, with if you can do your, your stock trading from Idaho, then there won't be any need for New York City. And Saskia kind of turns that on her head and says, no, actually, the, the hyper-specialization required to work in this brave new world means that these, these cities with the, the intense concentrations yeah. play an even greater role. So I, I, I'm kind of sitting here thinking, who will be the next Saskia to kind of figure out what the work from home dynamic looks like? And the final thing I'll just say is it's, it, it drives me crazy when you read, oh, God, there was just an article the other day about mass transit ridership and they give you one number for you know they're at 68 percent or they're at 70 mm percent -hmm. and of course that's a ridiculous number because what matters is the composition who's riding it when and and mondays look one way wednesdays look another fridays look and as everybody you know, if you talk to anybody who runs one of these transit agencies they'll tell you yeah monday is really really slow tuesday wednesday and thursday are getting close to where we were pre-covid Friday no longer has commuters, but is but is now has more people doing the, the leisure trip and other things. And so it's a it's a it's a different composition. You can't place that. And I think likewise with the office occupancy and the work from home dynamic. So it might be that you come into the office three days a week instead of five, but those three days may be even more important to your professional advancement and, and what you're happening than the five were before, which could mean that you're still going to value that office space where it is, the amenities that it, that it imposes and other things. And so it's, it's, it's been really hard because right now we're trying to reduce all of these to one or two numbers and try and make decisions based on them when actually it's a, it's a different lifestyle I, that, that, that's emerging that we're gonna have to, to really understand. I, I remain convinced that on a regional or metropolitan scale, actually the long-term effects of this could end up being quite beneficial. It creates more capacity for growth in, in parts of the region that, that were up to their limits before. It creates more opportunity, I think, for inclusive growth. It gives us an opportunity to address things like uh, resilience and others in ways that, that were going to be very, very hard to do pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, but, but I hope I'm, I hope I'm, my friends aren't right about the, <laughs> the doomsday scenario. Well, we, it seems to me we don't know anything yet because the, uh, use the term mark, might appreciate, the market hasn't cleared yet. 
uh, the, 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 the commercial real estate owners may have to take a serious haircut, uh, but they haven't yet. And they're still living in the world that, you know, you try to get someone to a landlord to lower his rent, their rent. It's very hard to do. Uh, but if this occupancy continues, the rents will go down. It yeah. just will happen. And they're not going to let it empty. The building has to be maintained. The loans have to be, everything has to keep going. Those, those rents will go down. And I, I did a study with Columbia's Center for Urban Real Estate in 2012, I think we did it. I think, Carol, you came to that event we did. Um, and it was about the tech industry and the rise of the tech industry in New York. And what I learned was that one of the reasons, you know, tech had been sort of growing surprisingly in New York 2002, 2003, 2004, and then it exploded around 2010, 11, and 12, such that when we were doing it, everybody to their amazement was saying, you know, New York is the second most important you know, center of tech activity, digital activity after Silicon Valley in the world, which was just not true seven, eight years before. Why? Well, one of the things we discovered was that because of the recession in after 08, this sort of catastrophic event, a lot of companies were had to unload space around what you know Madison Square. They had sort of optimistically in 2004 and five taken on a big growth cycle, five, six, taken on a lot of space, and now they were stuck with it and they didn't have anybody in it and they had to sublease. And so all kinds of tech companies that couldn't have dreamed of being in Madison yeah. Square or or Harold or uh, or you know the the lower Manhattan areas suddenly it was affordable, the prices had dropped and they moved in and it was a great thing for New York. It was incredible. It was one of the best things that ever happened in New York and a whole new industry got yeah. born, uh, got burned. And what would, you know, sort of expand that times 10 and what would happen if rents dropped by 20 and 30%? I mean, the commercial real estate owners would be miserable, but from the point of view of the ecosystem, commercial ecosystem of New York, it could be very interesting mm -hmm. if all kinds of companies that wouldn't have been able to afford Midtown Manhattan now suddenly could be in Midtown Manhattan and went like, we better take advantage of this. We better get a five-year lease going because it's this This is a good end. Who knows? It's but, the silver but, line. But we're not, what we do know is that the, you know, the prices haven't budged at all and the occupancy has gone down fairly with a really significant amount. And we don't know, we have to wait three, four years to find yeah, out what's going really to so uh, I'll disembodied voice ask a question and maybe I'll uh, make sure we can you can hear my question um, because I think we're all attesting to our um, our titles as New Yorkers sure. by talking about centrality here, aren't we? Uh, and maybe I'll, let me let me pose a question which may be too hard to ask or um, or uh, impudent in a way um, since we are validating the center and we are. Um, reinforcing the idea that the center creates the density for unpredictable unpredictability can we expand out now again to the region and say how important is planning if unpredictability is the is the the, the secret sauce of new york how does planning fit into yeah, unpredictability anyone else <laughs> that's a tough one i'm i'm always amazed at how you know, how can you possibly plan for New York? You know, the parking regulations on my block on Lispinard Street are left over from 1958, <laughs> which means that you're not allowed to park during the week and you are allowed to park on the weekends. Why? Because it was designed so the trucks could unload and load their goods of an industry that's been gone for 30 years now. And the parking regulations haven't changed because the city evolved underneath. Or I always love to imagine down also in Tribeca that you would go to when they were developing the Washington Market Urban Renewal District and tearing down all these loft buildings. And you went to Robert Moses or to the board and you said, no, actually you wanna keep those buildings because yeah. they're gonna be worth more than your new high rise housing projects. They would have looked at you, it would have been <laughs> incomprehensible what you were saying that under no possible imaginable circumstance could old warehouse buildings Nope, just wait 25 years. There, each little piece is going to be worth three million dollars, and you're a little low rise. You know, you're inexpensive. That may have been a good thing to build Independence Plaza North, but not to improve property values. Improving property values would have been let the old warehouses be there. 
how can you plan? How can you imagine when in the space of 15 years that could happen? You would have that kind of a turnaround of the very meaning of what a city is, the meaning of what a neighborhood is. I wonder about that sometimes. Let me add a twist, Carol, to your to your question. The fact that, uh, and I'm going to use the figure that the historically we have 1,400 governments mm -hmm. makes things unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah. there is a ser there is a weird serendipity in that unpredictability because they're all different. You could never, in a sense, I mean, New York City tried to have a master plan. Okay, yeah. you know, it, they have the volumes, but there's no master plan. You have actually master plans for neighborhoods or districts that seem to be much more workable than trying to do a master. But there is a kind of um, predictable unpredictability because of the fragmented government structure that we live under in the United States, whether it's in New York, whether it's Minneapolis, St. Paul, or whether it's Kansas City, or whether it's the Texas municipalities. I mean, there is a kind of you know, inherent diversity in the chaos of fragment, fragmented yeah. metropolis. Yeah. You know, that's really, so and that's my predictable unpredictability. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just want to return or, <clears throat> to, to answer your question, respond to it in, in a way by bringing up a, a theme from, I think it was the third regional plan uh, about uh, <clears throat> Places, you know, places of density, walkability, and so on, within you know, that is around the region. Around the region, because mm -hmm. if we can, you know, New Jersey is actually pioneering with these transit villages yeah. around yeah. around every uh, almost every every stop, rail stop. There's now some real yeah. density, and and every little town up the Hudson. You know, all those little yeah. towns are vibrant, exciting places. A lot at the expense of New York, but New York City, because people yeah. moved up there. But their their beacon and places like that are thrilling. They're gallery yeah. districts. People 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 couldn't have dreamed of twenty five years. Yeah. They're creating yeah. urbanity at a smaller scale. Yeah. I, I, that's where I was I was going with this too. I mean, I'm you know I, I do work in New Jersey and Connecticut, Long Island, the Hudson Valley too. I'm actually the chairman of the State Planning Commission in New Jersey, which was put in place alongside the Mount Laurel decisions to try to create some kind of master planning yeah. on a statewide basis. It doesn't, it's not a top-down plan. It's a kind of invitation for communities to engage with the state about what they're trying to do. But the remarkable thing that has really come out over the last 30 years is that towns want, these people want a little livable, walkable downtown to, mm -hmm. to go visit. It's, they'd love to live there too. Um, but if they can't, at least they'd like to be proximate to it and go and enjoy it. And um, and so these places are, and, and New Jersey, you know, was did a very intentional uh, experiment with this about 30 years ago that has paid off enormously. They invested to a great degree in New Jersey transit to try and create better connections to New York City, the Midtown Direct Service, the Secaucus Transfer, uh, the Montclair Connection all of which took lines where people had two seat rides or difficult rides and gave them a better seat into Manhattan to better connect themselves to the metropolitan economy. Of course, there's that one little weak link, which is the piece under the Hudson River, which we're still trying to deal with. But then the, the other thing that people don't, I, I don't think many people know about was through a series of bills in the 1990s, New Jersey gave municipalities, and for me railing against home rule kind of thing, this, this is maybe, I should, I should back it up a bit, but they gave mayors the ability and incentives through tax districts and other things to assemble sites and create redevelopment plans and, and, and do that kinds of transit oriented development um, in downtown areas. Uh, it, would, it would save them money on the, the, you know, what they would have to send to the school boards and other things. And so they had incentives to do it. And a lot of towns have done it. And that's where the growth has been in the state of New Jersey. It's diverse growth. Um, it's very successful. And, and I mean, just to give, this is almost unfair, but just to give a sense of what's happening in the region right now, for every one unit of housing permitted and built in Nassau County today, 10 are built in Hudson County on the other side of the mm -hmm. river. It's not twice as many, three times as many, four times. It's 10 to one. 
in terms of in terms of what's going on in in those innermost counties. And if you go out to Suffolk and say compared it to to Morris County, you know you'd see some, it's still something very comparable. And um, and so so there's a lot on a regional scale. They've kind of figured out, I think, to a certain degree. But it depends on that train. Yeah. you know, the reliable transit service because they still need the city. Folks are still bringing wealth back each evening from the city or in the weekends, the kids want to go into the city for a cultural institution or something like that. And so, and so it requires this, this, this region, this metropolis actually functioning to provide the diversity of lived experiences, housing opportunities, um, employment opportunities, et cetera. Um, and it's a fragile, it's a fragile connection. You know, we, we've seen, again, we are a, a joke about the tunnel under the Hudson River, but it really could fail uh, well before we build the new gateway tunnel. And, and we would see decades worth of prosperity and opportunity just out the window immediately. So, so there's a lot to fight for. So I think it, it wouldn't be an RPA and the Tom Wright production if we didn't end the talk, but, um, <laughs> the, the terror of the prospects <laughs> of a failure. I had to do it. I had to do it. Or doomsday scenario. So I okay. think the thing is, uh, is not complete, it's, but at it's, least it, 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 it has a, a, a kind of closure right, yeah. in terms of thematic. And it's, um, it certainly looks better today than it did yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, does, yes, we yes. We had, a, right, we had a tent revival with the Hudson Yards with President Biden this afternoon. Right. So it's a historic day um, in many ways um, about the past, the, the present, and hopefully the future of, of rail transit as, as well as of the metropolitan region. And I really can't think of four people who are better to um, equipped to have this discussion. So uh, it was really a stellar conversation and thank you, Bob, for inspiring okay, it. Okay. Uh, and um, I hope everyone out there enjoyed it and will find on, on the website very soon and uh, increase the, the um, exposure and expansion beyond the, the, the metropolitan area of, of these discussions about planning. So thanks everybody for being with us and thanks especially to our panel tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founder um, and the director of the Skyscraper Museum. And I'm here with actually two of the board members of the Skyscraper Museum, James Sanders and Lynn Segalen who we have um, assembled tonight at my request to, uh, to be discussants on the video that you may have seen previously or you may have just seen on the website. Um, a wonderful talk by our uh, another of our speakers, uh, uh, well, the talk by Robert Fishman, uh, an urban and planning historian, will soon uh, be joined by Tom Wright. But let me just mention that the context um, for tonight's talk is the centennial of the Regional Plan Association. And that centen centennial was brilliantly uh, feted and uh, illustrated back in October with, uh, well, a, a, a wonderful exhibition that James Sanders was the curator for. And he'll, he can talk very briefly about, but I hope you all saw it in the waiting room in the Vanderbilt Hall of Grand Central Terminal. What better place in order to celebrate the region than in Grand Central Terminal, and especially in that fabulous um, Beaux-Arts uh, train hall or, or architectural masterpiece. Uh, and um, as well as in a website which documents the enormous amount of digestive work that James did, uh, which is all part of his career of studying New York um, in a historical dimension. You probably know the spectacular series that he did with his uh, partner and co-producer Rick Burns, the New York, a documentary series, more than 17 hours of, uh, of video covering the whole history of New York. And indeed that's going to be joined by a few more hours this spring uh, by a, um, a look at New York in the 21st century and a, and a thought process about the future of cities. So what could be more appropriate um, to thinking about planning past, present, and future to have James here together um, discussing with Bob, who has over a course of a career which has only just recently become emeritus from his teaching position at the University of Michigan, 
uh, in the School of Architecture, the Taubman School of Architecture there. And Bob is the author of, of many books and many, many articles and especially influential books, both about urban and suburban history. Uh, but the occasion for tonight was uh, a, a conference uh, also in October that was run by the Society of the American City and Regional Planning History. And it was held up at, um, at City College uh, in Harlem. And urban historians and planning historians from all across the country, academics mostly, but also practitioners came together in this conference. And one of the many sessions that they had in October uh, was a session on the centennials of the Regional Plan Association and also the Regional Plan of New York and its environs. Um, Bob was the minority view in that panel where about five other people spoke about the, Ar the Regional Plan Association of America, the decentralist, uh, the suburbanist, um, Lewis Mumford and, and Clarence Stein and the like. And Bob valiantly presented the case for cities uh, and, you know, in New York. <laughs> and so, um, it seemed to me, and because we think very much alike, I think um, about our historical perspectives, that the, that his um, talk to a small circle of academics needed to be brought to a larger audience, um, just as um, the large audience that uh, the Regional Plan Association and James brought to, to Vanderbilt Hall um, in the flow through of the commuting centrality of, of Grand Central, that that we needed to continue the conversation in year 101. And so this is an effort to do that. And I hope that you have already heard Bob's very brilliant um, lecture, uh, but we're here together now to, um, and I'm going to introduce Tom Wright, who is the president of the Regional Plan Association and has been for some um, 20 years or so. Uh, 